Let's Talk Tunneling is produced by XRJV and proudly sponsored by DC Adams Group, Why Safety Matters. Um, and then you went to, to Wales again, you had another go there, and then you came back to the Channel Tunnel, Vic, but this was road headers, and then that AMTM method. I, I've heard of this, but can you explain what that is? Uh, the, the, the shock creep method, yeah. Um, uh, basically, it's an offset. NETM, it's new offshore tunneling method. Um, I think a lot of you guys will be well familiar with it now. Um, basically, it's sprayed on concrete, ladder, skirter, arches, spiraling bars, rock bolts, and sprayed on concrete, shock creep, we call it nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, according to the size of the, the tunnel face, it can be broken up into segments where you do sidewall drifts, maybe two sidewall drifts, one ahead of each other. Do a bit of separation for they allow the ground to settle or not to cause too much settlement. And then we come back and take a center, center pillar out. So I don't know, I don't know that actually increase as well, like, you know. So yeah, so it's just a new methodology. Well, it's not, it's not new anymore. It's been going around for a long time now. Well, that was, yeah, that was 1988. So yeah. Um, and then you did say you, you went to Greece, and that was a big job because you ended up six years in Greece. You must have liked it there. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, I went for initially for a two-year contract, and, and that was mainly all NATO work, yeah. Uh, we're turning under some some really uh, high esteemed buildings there, like the Grand Bataille Hotel. It was a really fantastic old hotel, probably six metres from the basement of it. A big bifurcation tunnel, a twin tunnel, and a single track coming into one directly underneath this. And we had to be really good, uh, really tight with our, our settlement values. So learning to speak the language uh, was, a bit, was a bit of a task, but uh, you had to do it quickly because you couldn't have an interpreter by your side. And you started off with the small words, you know, which keep the job running, like a basket for the, for the excavator would be called a Kalathi. So how do you remember these words? Well, you think of basket in basketball, yeah? So that's how you sort of remember them. And then a lot of the things, it's, uh, along the ter a lot of the terminology is, is medical terminology, like like derma is skin. So you think of dermatitis or dermatologist, yeah? So but another one was... Uh, a member used to grade the road out at night behind the road areas. On Friday night, we'd always go in and give a good grading and get the drainage good. And sometimes you'd have to go down some new stone base. They called that Petra, and I'm thinking, how the hell do I remember Petra? And then I remember, you think of the city of Petra or Lot's wife getting petrified, turned into a pillar of salt, you know. So this wow. is the, the comparison she made and how you link these words together. Yeah. Eventually, it became so good that I could tell him a joke in Greek. And when I went down to Melbourne, I found the Greek lads there. I reckon that I spoke more Greek than they did, and I used to piss them off. Yeah, yeah, that was a good job. We uh, very interesting. Then through a lot of uh, archaeological works, you know, you'd find these wells full of pottery, of the old brookwood pots as well. You know, like urns for pulling water up out of wells. Um, they were they were probably about one meter in diameter, and they were actually lined with three segments of fired clay, and the the analysts would have been packed with uh, pieces of marble, marble chips. So they were filled with silt and all this uh, conglomerate of broken pots or broken uh, jars, I should say. So it was a typical Greek jar with two lugs on it. And the only thing I could, I used to wonder, has there been a factory around this area or what was there? Because there was a grid of probably one of these every 10 metres. And then I thought, well, Greeks have been Greeks. They were very sociable people. So they're probably throwing this thing down into the well. They throw up the water. They've been yakking and talking and sort of misaimed their throw and hit it in the side of the well and it broken it fall in like you know stay there and then whenever they eventually get filled up with these broken pots we just sink another well and that was my philosoph philosophy on it anyway like. <laughs> sounds good mate <laughs> it was quite interesting getting through all of that that stuff and then i was on my way they were going to stop the job they're going to stop that particular 
last station was on because the tunnels would have they went through the TBMs are going to go through uh, an old cemetery, an ancient cemetery, yeah. So there's a bit of uproar about that, so they decided to to bin that that part of the job. So I was kinda of laid off. I was in the office and the tunnel manager was there and he said, Oh, it's a good to start a TBM, I need you to help me. So that's how I ended up staying so long. We went back and we started one of the, well, there was, was only one TBM. The other one was scrapped. Um, very interesting, very dangerous ground. We had to try all sorts of treatments ahead of that machine. We would have sinkholes. We had uh, these little kiosks they have, uh, the Greeks would have for selling newspapers, cigarettes, whatever. Like a little six, six foot by six foot kiosk on the side of the street. They were mainly uh, set up for the returning soldiers after the war to give them some income. And then the families would inherit them. So we just call them peripterals in Greek lakes. So this one is sitting on the side of the road. And uh, we're having these two collapses. We're coming up with the TBM, and we only had one there, one, the, one diameter of overburden. So I always remember the owner. He's a great uh, Olympia Colts football fan. And then played Arsenal, London team. And uh, they beat them, and it was all up to you about this. So, or yeah, we used to have a bit of banter, like, and then one night we'd be pumping concrete into the void. And we'd, we'd tilt it, he's bripped through his a little bit. He started shouting out the next morning and he called all the television cameras there and at CNN with every bloody camera you could think of. And these government bombs he had with. A cup of water spilled on them. It was all a big story. I said, don't worry about it. We'll start the machine a couple of hours time. I'll never hear it again. Lo and behold, we started the machine about nine o'clock that night. I woke up the telephone box for my wife to come and get me. I was probably 100 metres away and I heard a whoosh. And then that was the air pressure to come back up through the drill hole we had on the surface. 1,200 tonne block of concrete and dropped down on top of the cutter head and sucked all the surrounding ground in with it. The road was gone. The peripteral was sitting on the edge of this, tottering on the edge. I ran back down. We got the, the cameras there. I said, can you please move back? They said, we're on air, sir. So we've been in there in a moment. So we get out of the way and start dragging this tripod up the road like And then went back to the kiosk. Tried to, the woman's there. Half her kiosk is actually tottering the edge of this hole. I said, out, out, XOXO, X, get out. And uh, she told me she had customers. So I chased them. There's a big shop trying to get the woman out. She wouldn't leave because the money was inside. So was a, a lovely police woman came along and she said, can I help you, sir? I said, yeah, get the riot, please. And uh, start barricading off the rules and get these people out, please. So that was that was one of many sinkholes we had in that city because of the uh, the type of TBM we're using. It was exactly completely wrong machine from the ground. And you ended up back in, uh, or you ended up, sorry, you ended up in Sydney on the Epping to Chatswood tunnel, which this is probably around the time I started in tunnelling, Vic, to be honest. I, uh, I did a mining stint. And then I came into tunneling at the Cross City Tunnel in 2003. I did hear about your guys' job, and I'm really good old family friends with Phil Aiken. So uh, he did mention about that job and talked to, and that dad did a little bit of a, a stint there as well. So that's a 25k tunnel, 48 cross passage, and 29. Uh, you've got over fan niches. Can you explain the the fan niches? Please. Yeah, just um, in, in the uh, in the roof. So overt is instead of your invert, it's overt is up the top. So we'd have to um, get the uh, pecker in, the breaker, and um, break out the, the opening on the top so we could fit the niches in the, the, the fans in the niche later on. Yeah, yeah. it's just a reset for the ventilation fans. Yeah, so that's after that. So you've got the permanent tunnel, and then if they drive along you'll see these uh, big fans working, but you've got to make a, a crevice or a bit of an opening for them up in the roof. Is that right? 
That's, that's correct. So the trains could pass safely underneath as well, yeah. You've got to keep yeah. them outside the train envelope, yeah. And you broke a few records on that job too. Well, you broke one. Well, you got a world record, didn't you? Yeah, I, I didn't break them. The guys did it like, you know, good guys, you know. Uh, Andy Church was actually on the shift that night. And, and, um, really, I'm sure really pisses Phil off, like, you know. <laughs> and he's a good guy, Phil. And he'd, he'd gone away to take over the, the tunnel lining. So I was left with both TBMs. And we were there about, probably a week at the time. And, to be honest with you, you know, to tell you the truth of the whole story was we had a fatality for a, a young man, a young subcontractor had a heart attack and he had fallen into one of the uh, scent bombs and we hadn't realised it. Um, it was still brought it to my attention the following morning, so we let the guys go to work and he called in the fire brigade and the police and I actually found him in minutes. So the unions had shut the job down and were busy fencing off all the water holes around the place and any puddles. And uh, I had uh, a couple of guys in, and we, we'd done all the rollers and the conveyor, everything was ready to rock and roll, like, you know, because that used to take to about 12 o'clock on a normal day. So that day when we started for the world record, as soon as the men shift, they were able to crack on with it, yeah. And then I remember going in about half in the morning. I went up to Andy. I said, Andy, if you get your finger out of your back, say you get a good world record here today, like, you know. So they did. We ended up with it. And uh, in Virgilia took it over back from us again in Reykjavik in Iceland. But um, what they'd actually done was overrun the shift time. But that didn't matter. Then the Yanks really destroyed it back home in America. Yeah. They obviously found a good tunneling medium for that diameter, and they'd done something like 120 meters in a in a day. But yeah, it was, it was a good job, good people on it, real good people, you know. With likes of Mark, it was Phil's, Phil's brother there. We had Phil. Uh, yeah, man, your dad came in for a while. I thought at that time he was going away for to retire again. Like you know, I thought that's what he was going to do. You know, I remember him with a little truck for him going around. And, doing little handy jobs for us and <clears throat> always help you with anything. You've seen you struggling or even weren't struggling, he's always stopped to say hello and give you a hand with something like, you know, real real nice guy, gentle giant. Mm. Yeah, I didn't realise Phil, Phil was your, your cousin, Phil Shanley, yeah? Yeah, mate, yeah, no, um, yeah, we're, we're around the same age too, so, um, yeah, no, we're very close uh, and he's, he's helped... Uh, Helped me out lately with a lot of the stuff that I've been doing. So, yeah, he's doing really well. I'm going to get him on soon. So, um, yeah. I'm sure, Phil was told me a few stories about him and I. <laughs> he did mention one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you know the one, but um, yeah, no, he's he's a good guy. He's he's doing really well for himself. So yeah, both uh, he's got a couple of kids in the in the industry now too. So. They're doing really well, so I'm actually on on a project with one of them. So it goes it goes back to the old story I was telling you before, but boys not good fuck each other and then <laughs> and, and, uh, and becoming good friends, like you know. So it was all yeah. over the place, you know. And he came to see me later in life and said, "You give me a job," and I, said, I called him into the office and I said, "Look, so whatever we done, we done. We're both drunk, you know." And uh, I would never see any man's kids anymore in my own star because of the actions of two two men had a little bit too just too much juice in their bodies. Yeah. So he came and worked for me again, and he was a real good guy. I, I put him up through the ranks, and he, he, he done he done everything with his heart, and he really done it well. And he, he grabbed a hold of the situation, the chance he had, and he he, he really done well. I wish him all the best. Uh, mate, he's, he's doing well and, you know, Dad had a lot of time for him as well and and everyone, a lot of people have. He's got a lot of respect in this industry, so, yeah. But I'll get him on. He can uh, he can give us a rundown himself. So so from that Chatswood, you went to um, – you, you actually ended up in Melbourne and, and you did that sewer project and that was a long time too. You spent a lot of time. Yeah, I was um, – when I was finishing up in Sydney – um, John Lyle, uh, John, Harry Lyle, who was with uh, John Holland, he sort of said, would you fancy coming over? I thought, yeah, give it a go, quite like Australia by that time. 
and uh, went over. It was actually two projects rolled into one. You had NSP1 and NSP2. Basically, Melbourne Water owned NSP1 and Yarra Valley Water had NSP2, and they both joined into each other and flowed along. So I was there from breaking the ground to watching the grass grow again. It was a pretty, pretty interesting journey for me. I'd never been through that, all those stages of work on one project like before. Yeah. So, yeah, we uh, spent a bit of time in the office over at Abbotsford doing a bit of planning and getting teams together. And it was pretty lucky because there was a big road tunnel going on across the way. I really was a GPS in it. I used to go over and see this... Uh, I didn't think the last name I was a superintendent New Zealand that she had it me had it me had a minute ago then. Anyway, I used to go over and see him and Martin Harvey. That's his Oh yeah, Marty Harvey, yeah, yeah. So Martin and I used to talk about people's um, jobs coming to an end on his project and who would sit what I needed over where I was and gradually got a good team built up. We brought, brought the guys in and I like old Kai Forrester. And there's, there's a character I could tell you a few stories about him. But, uh, yeah, so brought them guys in, like, you know, and we had uh, quite a variety of, quite quite a variety of tunnel going on there, you know, with anything from hard rock TDM right through to a couple of little EPBs, pipe jacking by a uh, Italian outfit. Um, and blast, and we had shaft sinking with uh, excavators and breakers, and a bit of hand tumbling at the end. So the guy told us a little bit of everything. But uh, as a superintendent in the NSP two, he was he was called Nat Blues. You probably come across Nat. Oh uh, yeah, he's a legend. Yeah, so uh, that was over there for me. And old Frank Bonte, he was an NSP one. And that, and that would look after the uh, and Blast side of things and Shaft Sinking, they're a good, they're a good character, like, you know. And then we sent them over an EPB machine and we done a little drive with that. And, uh, a few shafts to sink with the old, old breakers. And took them a long time before they let us fire because of the, the surface, uh, surface, just like one meter gas moves and things like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Quite a bit. Of, Pipe Jack and was the Italian company. So, yeah, it was a really, really interesting job and interesting times with good guys. There's another good guy there called Dean Freddy from, uh, I think, I think we've done it. Uh, they've been around to a tap rate that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've since moved back to uh, back to New Zealand. But I um, saw a lot of sad times there as well, whenever the Black Saturday came in and the bushfires. A lot of good people. Uh, Dino was one of the ones who lost his property. Like, you know, really lucky they didn't go away with their lives. Like, you know, a lot of people were killed over in that part of the world. So, yeah. Uh, but then, I was, I was pretty quick when I was down there, actually. I contracted uh, tuberculosis. Nobody knows where I got it. But I went for about 104 kg to 76 in about six weeks. And then um, I can only say one thing. And if it wasn't for the guys I was working with at that time, I could probably never manage that project. And I could never probably manage my recovery. And they were real good guys. They all, they all took care of me. They all looked after me. And then they'd all pass the old juke, like, you know, one guy said, I'll tell you what, it had just died. You had to go better in the box than you do now, you know. So, with a few dudes going, anyway, I recovered it. I moved on with life and went to some other strange places after that. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I really think those guys were all the help and assistance that gave me on that project. Mm. Yeah. So you went from there, though. You went you went to West Africa, which I thought was an interesting move, coming from Melbourne and then, yeah, Guinea, is it? Yeah, so Guinea and West Africa, yeah. So it's an ex French colony, yeah. So they, all, they all speak that homosexual language of French, you know. Um, but um, it's a Muslim country, uh, poor country, 
really nice people, very adaptable people. We got bugger all, but uh, we make the best with what we got. And um, the rail line was probably about 700 kilometers long. So the mine was, so it was the building of a new mine for iron ore. It was actually the richest iron ore southern hemisphere. A lot of bauxite in that country, but aluminium, so the, the Russians were in there, Chinese were in. Uh, small independent mines, uh, rail lines, taking this bauxite into the port. So we were going to build a new auxiliary port to bring all the equipment in. Yeah, so we had to, uh, we had to build this new port. Uh, then the mine was 700 kilometers away from the port. There's all those mountains I talked about. Uh, it was right up near the, quite close to the Mali border, actually. And everything was done by, well, roads, but horrendous roads. You know, you get a wet season and dry season, simple as that. And once the latter right, when the road broke through, everything would just make these massive potholes where you'd see like a, an 18 wheeler, you'd just see the top of the top of the cab and the bottom of the bloody pothole, like, you know, the whole load would be submerged down in there. And all my work was done with helicopters mainly flying in and out to these remote locations. Um, and when the tunnels were no longer a go because of the the government uh, not holding the fair and transparent the elections, World Bank wouldn't loan the money, so we decided then we'd wrap up and get all the SI work done, the site investigation work done, which the Chinese were doing for us. So my job would be actually to uh, relocate these drilling rigs every 10 days or every two weeks to a, to a different area, go out to the villages, get the landowners, get the permit signed off so the guys could go in and do the 10 day drilling or whatever. And those are all interesting little trips. Like, you know, you go out with this old Huey chopper um, because of I got a bit of a lung condition from the tunneling and, the heat used to be horrendous. It used to be hitting about 49 degrees, like, you know. So I used to tell the pilots, get as close as you can to the village, yeah? So I didn't have to trek so far. And this day they got me in right beside the school, schoolhouse, yeah? All sacks roofs. We blew the bloody roof of the school, you know, part of the roof was gone with a downdraft of the helicopter. So lucky I had 50 US dollar in my pocket. I gave it to the chief and he was over the moon, like, you know. Sorry about your roof, mate. Here's 50 bucks. <laughs> yeah, I tell you. Um, so, then you sit around. There's some great preachers. I wish you could put them up and I would sit around, you know, and you had the interpreter there and you had the, the community relations and you had a guard with you with a stick, like, you know. And we're talking about one of the so called volatile regions of the world, that, you know, and there's a guard with a stick protecting you, like, you know. And um, you had green mambas, red, uh, black mambas. Sometimes you'd do treks through the elephant grass, which would be five meters tall. You'd lose all your GPS signal. You couldn't see the guy beside you five meters away with high vis. It was so dense, you know. You're looking down for bloody traps, gin traps in the ground. You're looking for the snakes. Uh, I remember one time I said to the doctor, like I said, have you any uh, compressive bandages, like, you know, for the snake bites? He said, I'll tell you what I do have. He said, you got your satellite phone. Just call the wife and say goodbye because you're never going to get out of there. <laughs> so, yeah, wow. it, was, it was fun for it. it was a very highly, highly military supported government, like, you know, so there was lots of army around. And you had the, the normal army, you had the presidential guard, you had the police, and then you had the lowest of all the pro traffic policemen, like, you know. Uh, we're under curfew all the time, you had to be in. You're in by 10 o'clock at night or 2 o'clock on a, on a Sunday morning. They let, you, they let you listen to Saturday night for a few beers. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Wow. That's that's awesome. That's that's incredible. You know, we, we, we whinge and moan having to jump on a couple of buses to get to work, and here you are going through snake-infested bloody green grass or long grass. So, yeah. Yeah, one time we used to come back. You know, you know, I couldn't work out why we used to come back quicker than we left. Like, you know, we took it to work and I, I put the GPS on and tracked that chopper one day. We're coming back. And what they're actually doing, they were cutting across the corner of uh, Sierra Leone. 
um, which is basically out of their airspace, like, you know, and after all the rebels had hid up in the highlands of Sierra Leone on our border there, have been chased out of uh, <coughs> Liberia during Charles Taylor's days, like, you know. So you just think, bloody hell, you could imagine an RPG or something taking it out of the sky here, like, you know. It was, it was never that serious. So then, then you ended up in Hong Kong in Kuala Lumpur. So I noticed with the information you sent me too, a lot of your tunneling work, especially later on after the, well, from Ireland, I suppose, has been all over the world, which has been incredible too. I do have a few questions um, for you, Vic, if you don't mind answering answering the best best way you can. The first one is uh, why tunneling? You know, you'll work at walk in the streets for seven days and someone said, yeah, pointed you in the right direction. So what was interesting about it for you, uh, tunneling? Yeah. Okay, well, look, I just left Northern Ireland, like, you know, and by that time in Northern Ireland, all, all the troubles were kicking off. And I really didn't want to be a part of that. I wanted, I wanted to get out, got out. Uh, as a young man, you know, I always look for excitement in life. And even from that first night in the Mersey Tunnel, I thought, yeah, this is something I want to do, like, you know. It had an element of danger to it. Um, you had to dodge the bullets. It was, the money was good, you know, it was getting maybe 50 bob a week on, on the dole. And here I was suddenly pulling in 60 quid a week, like, you know, way back in the day. So met a lot of good people, learned a lot of stuff. Um, seen different disciplines in the tunnel, you know, the different methodology. There was always a constant learning curve. Even today, you're still learning, you know. So it was, it was a challenge for me. And there was all these challenges, yeah. And it was thinking on your feet and getting things done and being innovative, which unfortunately we can't do nowadays. No, we're not allowed to do it nowadays. We can pass the thoughts, but uh, we have to depend on and a lot of other layers of other people now to you before we can get work done, which is a bit of a shame. But I see, I see why it's going that way. Mm. So the other one is uh, what do you think people need to know about tunneling before they start? So if they were interested in getting into or making a career out of tunneling, they had an opportunity, what what would be something that you'd want to tell them about tunneling? Well, number one, like, you know, it's, it's no walk in the park, like, you know. It is a little bit easier nowadays, but it's not it's no walk in the park. And yeah, you have to be disciplined for your, for the safety. Um, you, have, you, you really have to tell the family, you know, whether well, so I'm going to do a lot of shift work, um, long hours. Be aware of it, what's going on around you. Be really aware, like, you know, and never get complacent. Complacency, I suppose, is one of the biggest killers or things that get people seriously hurt in the industry. Always listen and don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, anybody like my age, you want to ask me as many questions you want to know. I'll keep giving you the answers. It might not always be the answer you want to hear, but I'll give you an answer, yeah. Uh, great, mate. So the, so this one here is is something I suppose you've, you've touched on, you know, what do people need to know, what's something they'll need to know about coming to the tunneling now. But this one here would probably be for yourself. So if you could give yourself some advice and send it back 49 years for that to that that Sunday where you're having a sleep or you're probably having a bit of a rest before you went into that night shift, if you could send a note back to that uh, that morning for that young Vic to, to read, what would be one of the things on that piece of paper? Yeah, well, the very simple, like, you know, when I was 38, I was diagnosed with silicosis. Yeah. So when I went to my first job that, that time, I went along to the, the store to pick up my PPE, which was, like I said before, was basically a long, a long like a fisherman's cape all the way to below my knees with a hood on it, uh, tight, tight length boots because of the depth of water, a helmet, <coughs> uh, no mask, 
They didn't give me a pair of gloves because my clock number had to be 3,000. It's a tough story for me. I saw the sort of come up with a lucky dip leg, you know. Um, you drilled and blasted. You went in there. You, you entered the dust. You washed it. You washed it. You killed the dust with the hose pipe. Sandstone, you know, a, a lot of uh, silica in it. Um, a lot of places we just didn't get the PPE we, we should have been getting. Um, working in them small road headers, you know, on hard rock and the dust pouring out past you. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it's killed my lungs. Um, I, I, I go on, you know, people don't want me to run a marathon anymore. They just want my brain, like, you know, what I can offer them. But um, it's, it's destroyed my, my standard of uh, life for walking around. I mean, some days I could walk 20 metres, I'd have to stop. Some days I could walk a mile, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty sad, but I would always advise a young man. A uh, well, young man, Demo, I'm sure you know Demo. Demo, uh, he was in the road header for me down in Melbourne. I went down to Shaft one day and uh, I kicked off because they hadn't extended the ventilation into the heading, like, you know. And uh, they said, you want to see your grandchildren? You'll be able to play football with your grandkids. You want to do this, you want to do that, you know. He'd give me a bit of a smart answer and said he didn't expect to live to the age he was. So that's not, that's not the answer I want to hear, mate. Why do you work for me? You get your ventilation sorted out and you breathe as good a quality of air as you can possibly do. And it's one of the things I do here. And it's done, done ever since I've been diagnosed as trying to get good ventilation for people because it's very important. Um, to, to, I, I talked to the guys here because we got a bit of uh, grinding wheel stuff, you know, the attachment for the excavator to, to trim the profiles. And, uh, I tell them, look, if you don't want to wear your mask and you know, your respirator, whatever, you, I don't want you, you know, you better have a sea change, go elsewhere. Because let me explain to you what it's like. It's like running 100 meters and trying to recover, struck, sucking the air through a straw. It's as simple as that. You're absolutely suffocated. So they look at you, you know, in disbelief, but uh, it's as simple as that. I'm, I'm probably like an old vintage car. I look pretty good on the outside, but inside the engine's a bit tired, yeah. <laughs> no, thank you, mate. No, I appreciate that. And that is a big issue here. And, you know, I've been lucky and fortunate enough that I've met some amazing people in that space that are doing some great work. And, yeah. and you know, some of the seminars that I go to with my safety talks, there's some um, some really amazing people that are doing some good stuff for tunneling. So, yeah. But thank you for sharing that. The other one the other one would be um, how do you stay focused? Uh, you know, you're still in the game. So is there, a, is there a driving force while you've been in it so long and, and what gets you up in the morning to, to still be in it? Yeah, well, look, I get up at 4.30 every morning, you know. I know every morning I do five days a week now. I do the odd six days, but um, 4.30, I get home about 7.30 in the evening. Um, obviously, the money's still there, but it's not all about the money. Like, you know, I find that during the weekend, when I'm lying around or I'm having this week off now, um, I really, really struggle with my health. So I need to get that up and get it out and get a bit of exercise and get something going on in my brain. I find too many people who've been in the industry all their life, they park up and six months later, they, they, they pop the clogs because they don't know anything else, you know. I've never been a great one for hobbies. I've had the motorbikes. I've had a bit of fishing, but there's only so much of that you can do now. And um, so the next thing I guess I'm going to do is get my wife set up in a little business and help her. But I really have to do something to be active. I've got to be active and I've got to keep my brain functioning. That's why I still keep out of this day and age, like you know. And I think I've got a lot of knowledge to hand over the younger ones and. I could tell them, you know, if you want to learn, um, I can teach you. If you don't want to learn, nobody can teach you. Simple as that, like, you know. Well, that's something that I wouldn't mind sort of discussing with you, I suppose, in depth or further, because how, how important would training or educating and mentoring what you're doing now 
How important that is that for our industry? Oh, no, that's that's very important. It's very important in this day and age. Like you know, this you know we we've made the, the industry a lot safer and a lot respectfully. Excuse me, the type of machinery we have, but um, still a lot of things in those machines that can snag you up and get you seriously hurt or worse. And uh, I still think that we have probably one of the the best systems over this part of the world, and I guess you guys do as well. Is and um, nobody goes straight into the the face. We start like I did, like as a miner's mate or a, a nipper. And you work your way in through to the face, and that's the best way to learn. Like you know, and you'll meet a grump, a few grumpy old people on the way who keep you in check and keep you focused. But um, mainly, yeah, it's for me. It's starting at the bottom and working your way to the top. Too many people nowadays, and I still find it, especially in the engineering division, who have likes of designers and that have never actually worked for the contractor. And the design, all this stuff, which is virtually impossible to build. So, yeah, so it's all about experience. Mm. No, that's great. I know uh, they're trying to do some of that stuff here in, the, in Melbourne with a with a training academy and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. I know these plans for quite a number of years of tunneling here, Sydney and Australia, and. And having a, a, an academy or a, they're calling it a tumbling school. And I know England's got one. I've, I've heard about your, the one over there. And I think they've modelled it a little bit of, around your English one here in Melbourne. So it'll be, it'll be interesting. And I know uh, a lot of the guys um, haven't been as, uh, in the industry as long as you, but they're very keen to help out in that space as well, especially the mentoring. I know Dad did a lot of it uh, right up to his, his passing. But, and that's something that I've tried to in some way, even with this podcast, is uh, is carry that educational side of, of tunneling on. I think it's a great industry. It's something that I've learned a lot in myself and you can do so much in it. Like it's endless sort of things you can learn. And I suppose even with someone in 40, 49 years experience, you're still learning. Vic, you, you reckon? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You're learning every day, like, you know, especially the advent of new technology, like, you know, yeah, they keep up with the, the pace of things or you drop out, simple as that, or you just stay with some old, same old, same old system, like, you know. But I, I like to be progressive and carry on moving forward, like, you know. And I always, I always go back to that Melbourne's job where I had a little connection to do with one of the live stores in the new store. And uh, the recommendation was a 4.9, metre tunnel. I said, why that size? We're only doing a 600 connection, like, you know. So that's the smallest tunnel we can get a little machine into. They excavate it. I said, no, we'll do some steel sets and timber heading drive and jack picks. They all looked at me and I had old Kai Forrester with me and I got it all set up for Kai and Peter Carton and people like that. And a couple of little skips I had from the Colonel Dow, little Hudson side tipper skips I got. And we set this up and it was only a short drive, but the boys really, really enjoyed it. Oh, yeah, and man. Nat Lou was over in NSP1. I used to say to Nat, look, mate, whenever you get new, new starters coming on, send over to me, like, and we'll stick them on the shovel with Kai there, like, you know, and give them a bit of a baptism in the tunneling, like, you know. So oh, with all these kids move in and the sweat, they run out the ass of the pants, and I get wagged down there. Hey, he's doing that. Oh, great. Like, they're absolutely dying on their feet, like, you know. But if they stuck it out, they were going to do all right. If they didn't stick it out, well, they were gone, yeah. They went on their own accord, like, you know. But that was, that was a little trial spot for them. Well, that, that's gold because I hear about those things now and, you know, this generation that are in the in the game now, and it's quite interesting when you hear them talk about uh, their experiences going through that sort of stuff and especially the air legging days, you know, putting in, even though it's little service pins, but, you know, setting it all up with your mesh and, and you know, having your drill steels ready, your collar and your holes and all that sort of stuff. And I know Dad and working with Phil uh, Shanley as well, you know, he was... He was keen to get that done, get a couple of young fellas, and even Phil Shanley's young fella came with Dad for a little while, and he went through that same process. And I think that's great too, and that's something that I believe we shouldn't lose 
you know, should always be in there in some way. We should create a little, even if it's just a little off cut on one of the drives, a, a cross passage, we knock a, a little bit out there. It's still productive. We can still knock it through, even if we're just doing a little bits at a time, you know, just give them that, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, reality check or as you said and you've said it quite a few times you know that culture uh, that that's um character building you know for them to to launch off so uh, that's that's great yeah. so i always remember you know we went up, went up to north wales we've done that power station up there and obviously we had uh, we had to employ a lot of local labor because it was a pretty run down part of the world um not much in well, no industry it was mainly tourism and what we done the, the tunnel, which was actually taking the cables from the power station, we turned it into a training tunnel. So we would have anything from the two boom jumbo on rails on week, and then the next week at the air legging, and then we'd have the MCO slingshot or another machine called a pinion, we'd have shock beating. So we trained the guys all the way through the different steps in there, like and it was it was quite interesting when the Swedes was with us. The Swedish company called Jockey. And uh, these guys they used to get all these trainees out in the mountain in the morning. And it was, a, it was the next uh, slate quarry. So there's all these massive slate tips, like, you know, the, the spoil. And the Swedes would have these guys running up the, the, the mountain saying, if you're a good miner, you must be fit to mine the body. And of course, they'd all earning big bucks for the first time. They'd been drinking piss all night. So they're running around and throwing up at the same time. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh... Well, mate, I um, we're going to almost wrap it up here. I, I, I've really enjoyed listening to you, and and also for your support in Let's Talk Tunneling. I know you've you've mentioned or you've commented a couple of times on my posts, and and I'm really grateful for that. But before I I sign off, I I, I just want to say, and this came from uh, my father's script that he wrote, uh, and it's a lot of the the projects uh, in Sydney and Melbourne are using a couple of words that my father had written that we found in his work locker after his accident and uh, it says um, is there anything or well, his words are, I'd like to say to younger men coming into tunneling but for you is there anything you would like to say to the younger people coming into tunneling just to close us out yeah I think I pretty much touched on it there but I will I will reiterate it again um, when it was down in Sydney, you know, with the TBMs there, um, they were doing a cross it's quite a long one, and they're using one of the road headers, like, you know. But uh, that, you see the operator up there with a the mask on and holding a cigarette burning away. And uh, I said to myself that day, like, you know, you know, I, I knew I had the dust at that stage in the lungs. And I said to myself that day, uh, Australia... One day the silicosis was a big issue, and I think it's just starting to come into the fore, forefront now. It's starting to be identified big time now. And that's mainly because of the road errors, my friend. I tell you now. And uh, I would advise any man who's going in there, like I said before, get your ventilation right, get your PP right. Um, if it's not right, don't do it. And it's, it's not worth the money. It's not worth the, the destruction of your, your own body end of the day because you want to be able to live and uh, enjoy the fruits of your life and you want to do that with a good quality of life so take care of the health that's number one good on you Vic I uh, really appreciate that mate and I know that a lot of people will be uh, getting a lot from this podcast so mate um, on behalf of of myself um, and my crew with Let's Talk Tumming but also the, the tunneling community here in Australia and, and a lot of the Kiwis you work for. I just want to thank you for your, for your time that you have spent in Australia working on these projects. And I wish you all the best in your company and everything that you do from, uh, from now on with your health and everything, mate. So thanks again. I appreciate it. I'll, uh, I'll get this out as quick as I can. I'll let you know and I'll, I'll, f I'll fill you in on when it's coming out anyway, mate. So. But thank you, um, and take care. Okay, really appreciate you taking the time to have me on here. Give all the best to my good friends in that part of the world. Okay. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Okay. Wow. So that's uh, Let's Talk Tunneling, another episode that was with uh, a great tunneler. So, yeah, stay tuned. There's uh, plenty more coming out. Um, 
you know, I've got uh, I've got a few in the library now. Um, we'll work on on Vix's, Vix one, and we'll have that out soon. So stay tuned. Uh, it's on SoundCloud as well as my YouTube, and I'll be putting out links as well. So thanks very much, and take care.